Already today, you've interpreted countless moments. From conversations with friends, to events in the national news, to even how your story is playing out. We look at all of those through our lens of interpretation. And the cost of misinterpretation is huge. It affects how we see ourselves, others, and even how we view God. I'm Alan Arnold, and you're listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. We're in a series now called Interpreting Your Life. If you haven't heard the first part, I encourage you to go back to last week's podcast and listen to it. The conversations you're hearing took place in 2014 between John Eldridge and Craig McConnell. And we're re-airing this series now because we know how central this is to really everything in our lives. It affects our family, our friends, our faith, and even our intimacy with God. So I invite you now to join us for part two of this series with John Eldridge and Craig McConnell. I want to come back to if what we're trying to do is help with correct interpretation, we're also trying to rescue you friends from from the cost, the cost of misinterpretation, the agony, the years of pain, confusion, guilt, sorrow that comes with misinterpretation. And I think one of the great dilemmas of the human race goes like this. Yes, yes, you were made for happiness. Yes, you were made for Eden. Your soul was literally shaped and created for your best summer vacation experience times 10. You know, Hmm. just, yes, of course you seek peace and relief and healing and goodness and pleasure. You're made for pleasure. You're actually, we're made for ecstasy. Yes, 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 yes. The problem is, if you don't understand the interruption in the story, you're going to really get upset about this because mankind, Christians included, make pretty much the aim of their daily experience getting that back, getting a taste of it at least. You know, if I can't have Eden, I can have a great lunch. You know, if I can't have a rich relationship with my wife, I can get on the internet, at least get a little something. That ache, that pull, I know it seems like your life is about happiness, but there was an interruption in the story. And we lost Eden, and mankind fell, and evil entered the picture. We're in the midst of a great battle now. And in addition to that, God is addressing things in your life. We are moving towards ecstasy, pleasure, summer vacation times 10. We are close. We are close. But there's something in our reaction to life's events that shows we're confused about timing. Mm. We get ticked. Mm. We rage at God. We get discouraged. We lose heart because we're not finding happiness right now. We can't have that baby. We can't find that person to be in relationship with. We can't get our kids to behave or, you know, whatever it is and want to bring back to the table the interpretive grid of, do you understand what God is primarily after right now? Because if you do, it's going to reshape the way you interpret so many things. So let me read something from George McDonald, he's talking about what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ? And he says it is not to follow him, to take him in any way theoretically, to hold this or that theory about why he died or wherein lay his atonement. Such things can be revealed only to those who follow him in his active being, right? Who do as he did, live as he lived. And then listen. There is no other following. To follow Jesus is to be learning of him, to think his thoughts, to use his judgments, to see things as he saw them, to feel things as he felt them, to be hearted, sold, minded as he was, 
Mm. that so also we may be of the same mind with his Father. This it is to deny self and go after him, nothing less. Even if it be working miracles and casting out devils, is to be his disciple. I really think we kind of have this posture of, well, discipleship is kind of optional. It's for the super saints or those in ministry or those who want it, you know, those who kind of have a taste for spiritual life, you know, but for the rest of us, it's about having a nice home yeah. and redecorating the, the bedroom. It's about repainting the kitchen and getting the grass or about just having an apartment or it's about, you see what I'm saying? We really honestly believe it's about making life work now. And that's where I want to suggest half at least of our shock, dismay, confusion, angst, anger, frankly, rage, comes from. It's this fundamental misunderstanding of what is going on right now. And in particular in the life of the believer, what God's after. It's like, oh, he's committed to your happiness, right? But friends, this is not about maybe getting a little nicer car, hmm. taking a little longer vacation this year, getting a little raise. Yes, you're made for happiness and it's coming. It's coming. But there's this fundamental confusion right now in people's souls about what God's up to. And they, they get mad at God. They get confused, disheartened. They lose heart for decades because of this one fundamental confusion. Those are good words. John, I'd love just to hear your thoughts on your partner, Brent Curtis, his death years ago, and from your own story, your own life. What did you do with that in God? That's a few years back. What has the interpretation of that been? Let me discuss two phases of that that I think will be helpful for our listeners as they're thinking through their own life and God. There was the immediate and then over time. In the immediate, when I received the news in those first few days, in those first few weeks, I knew, I knew in my soul, you can have God or you can have understanding, hmm. but you aren't going to get both right now. Maybe down the road, maybe down the road you get both, but there really is this choice and the anguished soul just cries out for understanding, cries out for an explanation. Why mm. is the first thing that comes out of our mouths, right? And that's all gracious and understood and no shame in that. But friends, like right away, you can have God or you can have understanding. And so in those initial moments, crying out for God, like, God, I need you. You got to catch me in this. You got to catch my heart or I'm going to go to some really awful places with this. Like, I can feel the downward spiral. So that was part of the immediate experience was just God. Mm -hmm. And then earlier in this discussion, we talked about healthy emotional life, and emotions are good and fine. And, and so allowing the grief, allowing the loss, allowing the sorrow, but not to despair. See, that's the catch. And it's almost like I was aware that I had to shepherd my own heart in that. Like, yes, grieve the loss. Yes, I hate death. Death is a violation. Death is not God's plan. Mm -hmm. Death is not God's plan. It came in at the fall. Eternal life was God's plan. The tree of life was in the center of the garden, not the tree of death, the tree of life, okay? So, yes, rail at death, yes, grieve, but also catching my heart, again, in interpretation, catching my heart going, don't go to despair. Yes, sorrow and grief, don't go to despair, don't go to hopelessness. In the early days, there was some raging at God, hmm. and I would take a baseball bat, and I'd go into my garage. We had these big trash bins that the city provides, and they're kind of huge trash containers, pretty sturdy, and I would just wail on those. Partly, I was railing against the evil one and against death and against all that came in the fall of man. Partly, I was railing at God mm. and crying out. And also in the early days of the grief, I was 
shocked and exposed at what I would do to find relief. Mm-hmm. I would turn to everything. I mean, I tried food, sex, alcohol, tobacco. I mean, just, you know, I didn't shoot heroin. I didn't have an affair. I didn't go down some of those dark roads. But I was just shocked at my soul scrambling for some kind of relief, comfort, and how God was like seventh Mm -hmm. on the list Mm -hmm. of where my soul kind of immediately goes. And I saw that Mm -hmm. and shepherding my heart in that time and just going, oh God, like, look at me. I'm so exposed. I'm such an unbeliever. I'm such an idolater. Come in this. Come in this. Come in this. I want to emerge from this a far more holy and powerful man than I am now. Mm -hmm. That was all in the immediate days. And that all came and went like the crashing of the sea. You know, the tide ebbs and flows. And sometimes it's calm. Sometimes it's violent and all that. Over time, I really had to wrestle with and come to, what are my conclusions about Act 4? What do I really believe? Honestly, truly, really believe. What do I believe about Brent? What do I believe about his family? Again, just interpretation, interpretation, interpretation. You know, what are my real convictions about this? Because if I really believe that Brent is glorious, I mean, he's alive. People don't die. Mm -hmm. God's friends don't die. You don't die, right? Jesus said, he who believes in me will never die. And if he dies, he shall live forever. Like, you don't die. Whatever it is that we conceive of death, this end of existence, this stopping of being, actually does not take place. And then God gave to me some pretty precious gifts. And they took place at retreats, and they took place during very significant worship sessions in the midst of the very work that Brent died in. It was our very first men's retreat where he was killed. I saw visions, just a couple of them. One was a vision of the armies of God in heaven preparing for Act 4 and the invasion, the return of Christ Mm. with his armies. And those armies include angels, but they also include the saints. And I saw Brent in the line, Mm. live, noble, Mm. young, Mm. handsome, you know, and just the confirmation of right, 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 like... Death is such a violation, but death is also a lie. Mm -hmm. It's a lie. And the enemy just uses it as this big mocking lie. He's not dead. He's not dead. And it changes everything. It really changes my perspective on it, on what happened. And then I have to allow for mystery in all that. I think the death of one of God's saints, I think the death of one of his children is really shrouded in a lot of mystery. The timing of it. Why then? Why is it, you know, he had a lot of good years ahead for him. You know, why does the homeless guy get to live to be 87, but not Brent? And I mean, I'm just content with mystery. I think you said there's kind of a humility there where I've got to be careful. Some of the conclusions I come to about that and, and just allow for, I don't know. I don't know. Some questions get answers in act four, not act three. John, in that time when you were railing, raging, smashing trash cans. What could others have done or been? What's the response to someone who is going through a hard time and grappling with genuine emotions and feelings that take them to the brink? How do we come alongside someone who's struggling in how to interpret God's presence, involvement, Mm -hmm. and what's unfolding? Mm -hmm. What was needed or Mm -hmm. what came or was helpful? I think the first thing is the space to express what you're feeling. First, don't Mm -hmm. go first to interpretation. That's jumping the process. You know, Mm -hmm. I think for people to just ask, what are you feeling? Not even how are you doing, but the specific question, what are you feeling? Because sometimes when you go through something as traumatic as that, you shut down a lot and you don't know what you're feeling. And a lot of times people just go numb dissociate, check out, shut down, all graciously understandable, but really helpful for someone to come along and say, what are you feeling? Put some words to that. And then from that place, 
yeah, in the kindness to say, how are you interpreting this? What's your take on this? Right. And to allow conversation, words, expression about that again, without condemnation, mm-hmm. as we reveal some of our godlessness, as mm-hmm. we reveal some of our absolute idolatry, you know, our apostasy, our addictions, all of that. How are you interpreting this? Where are you going with this? What's your take on this? And then I think that what would have helped me more in those early days is people talking about the restoration of all things. Like, that's just everything, gang. Like, that's our treasure. That's the, mm-hmm. it's everything. And so more conversation about that would have been helpful as well. Mm-hmm. Just believing in the restoration of all things for another person. Like, yes. you, you hold faith for them for a while until they can recover faith. You hold faith for them. You hold interpretation for them mm-hmm. for a while. Helping, bringing them back to, I get it, totally understand you're feeling all that. And... Are you remembering the restoration? Are you remembering Mm -hmm. the renewal of all things? Because we bring each other back. Mm -hmm. We bring each other back, Mm -hmm. right? You allow space for the emotions and you bring each other back. Allow space for the emotions. Help to put words to what they are believing and interpreting. What's your interpretation? What's your take on this? What are you believing about all this right now? And then step three, gently bringing them back to a correct interpretation Mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as a friend, concern for someone, just believing that God is good and that God can use this and believing for them that that it may take a while, but they're going to land on their feet with something far deeper and richer Yep. as a result. Holding that kind of hope yes. for them, right? Yeah. That, oh my gosh, yes, you bet. To have someone in your life that believes that, it's a huge gift. More on this, but as I was coming in to record with you, Craig, I was praying and asking Jesus, what do you want to speak to, especially regarding people's interpretation of you and your actions in their lives? And and he said, speak to the resentment that builds up. Mm. When you do live through periods, sometimes long periods of what feels like the silence of God or unanswered prayer or certain very specific unanswered prayers, for a son or a daughter, a friend, you know, a child, your work or whatever, it builds up resentment in the soul toward God. And we just have to be honest about that. And we have to be honest about where it is in us because that is going to hurt your relationship more than anything else. And it's going to cause you to pull away and it's going to cause further misinterpretation of what he's doing. And so, One, to be aware of disappointments, hardship, unanswered prayers, silence, confusing actions by God or the lack of actions by God builds up resentment in the soul toward him. You might pretend that it's not there, but it is. And what's amazing, and I wrote a little bit about this in Beautiful Outlaws, what Jesus invites us to do is to forgive him. We don't forgive God like we're God and he's human and we're now taking the role of judge. We forgive God for the silence. We forgive him for the confusion. We forgive him for the unanswered prayers. In other words, you release the resentment. You let that go. You forgive it. And you actually love him, love him in this very place. You love him in the silence. You love him in the unanswered prayers. You love him in the confusion. When you do that, staggering things happen in the universe. Staggering things. It absolutely shocks and dismays evil. They do not get that one action. That one action they do not understand. And so it disarms the power of evil. And it also opens your soul up to hearing from God, to getting through the darkness, to getting through the silence. It opens your soul back up to him to receive his love, his comfort, his presence. And thirdly, the transformation of your character when you do that. It's one of the most redemptive things to do with your disappointments and your confusion. I mean, the holiness that that brings in you. So, You love him in this place. You release your resentment toward him so that you can find God again. Mm -hmm. So good. 
We're going to pause there. We'll be back next week with part three of Interpreting Your Life with John Eldridge and Craig McConnell. I'm Alan Arnold, and you're listening to the Ransom Heart Podcast.